curate mess. And I'm really delighted that um, we were able to pull this together. We have three different panelists, uh, one of whom, Jane Kaufman, just completed a book on the Jews of Western Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, Sharon, who represents uh, the Jewish Historical Society of Western Massachusetts, and a uh, video that was prepared by him, uh, Noah Kauf, and, and, and probably uh, Ken's wife, Jane Draguer, for the uh, exhibit in uh, the Jews of Massachusetts, Western Mass that's in Springfield right now. And then let's, uh, Krista Whitney, who's the uh, director of the oral history of Africa at Wexler, who's the patron for this, but I can't remember all the titles. But essentially, uh, thanks to Mr. Wexler's uh, generosity, she's doing an oral history program. It has been for a number of years out of the Yiddish Book Center, uh, and she talked about that. So we were going to do this kind of with Jean first, but I think we're going to... last thing is that Noah wants to be able to videotape this, and in order to do that, uh, actually, two, two announcements. One is, uh, in order to videotape this, we want to make sure that people are um, okay with showing up on video, and it's not like we're going to have a lot of close-ups, reaction shots of your face or anything, but technically, we're supposed to get a release, you know, if you show up in there at all, and so if you don't want to be seen for some reason, then just let us know, and we can make sure that the camera doesn't go to you. Uh, and if you do, you know, we've got a little release you can sign. Uh, no one actually knows how to do that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. is that this is brought to you by the Adult Ed Committee of the, the community of Amherst. And we have, we have a whole uh, series of really fun uh, programs that we're going to be doing all through uh, March and April and May. And uh, if you, I think we still have some in the lobby, right? Some of the, some booklets, yeah, in the some booklets in the lobby, if you want to see. Or they're, they're all also listed online as well. And really, um, hoping that you can come because we put together, I remember the committee, um, and we put together, I think, a really interesting collection of, uh, of events. So um, with that, what, oh, the format today is that Ken's gonna show a little video, not the whole thing, and talk for maybe 10 minutes, um, and then um, Jane and then Krista, and then that opens up really the whole rest of our time for discussion and questions. That's really what's fun. Uh, you know, if all you want to do is stare at a screen, you can just go home and watch TV. So I think it's much more fun to do some interaction here. And I know that uh, Jane has brought copies of her book, not just um, to purchase, but in fact she'll be passing some out that we can all look at as she's talking. So it, it, it'll be a great afternoon. And again, thank you. Uh, Ken, do you want to start off? all for coming today. It's very exciting for us. Um, I think we'll I start with the film, which was done about six years ago, six to five years ago. And the film was done because the community in Springfield, the Jewish community, was going through a lot of transition, a lot of changes. And we were concerned, a bunch of us up here, that a lot of the history would be lost in the closing of a whole bunch of shuls down there. So we went down there, my wife was getting prepared, and myself, and we interviewed a whole bunch of people. And then, uh, with the help of Noah Cork, who edited it, put it together, we uh, prepared a, it's now about a 45 minute film, which discusses the history of the Jews of Springfield. For the purposes of today, Noah has edited it down to about 12 minutes, just to give you a sense of it. It will, it is on YouTube, Memories of Springfield, you can look it up. It's a wonderful video. But for the purposes of today, it's a brief taste of the Jewish community, the life, what it was like, what it's like now, where the people got together, where they ate, 
gives you a good sense. And after that, I'm going to raise some points about it for further discussion. And if you want more information on Jewish historical societies, um, I'd love to tell you it's really based on private donations. We get funds basically from 12 public institutions. It's all privately done, a really local kind of grassroots operation. And we hope to do Amory's next. We basically focus on Springfield and a little bit on Northampton. And we'd like to do Amory's next. So that's just a note. I know it's going to go around, by the way, with a, uh, a hand to a uh, audio, audio. Yeah, questions. Audio, questions or comments. So you can take them. Okay?
trying to remember some of the stories that were in that area. There were so many of them, I don't know. And I'd say that 90% of them were Jewish. And, and on the other side, on the on the side, on this side, the southern side of the arch, there were stores and stores and stores of women's clothing and men's shoes and everything. And most of them were owned by Jews or run by Jews. Oh, Thirty Street ran from Main Street to Dwight Street, and it was the world's Jewish center, shopping center of Springfield. <laughs> Were they Romanian, Russian? Where were they from? Either up. Either up. They're around. From home. But why would you go to one butcher over another? Why? Because this is down. Came from this thing. Shepherd. Shepherd. Which was? She came from a small town in Lithuania called Aran. Did they know each other in the old country? Yes, they did. They did. So we had in Springfield at one time there were like seven kosher butchers. Only one two the ah which one? That was fantastic. Then he sell it just an open guy. Then he initially was on Main Street near the Arch. It's all 45 minutes up? It's all 45 oh, minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
So it's just Jewish memories of Springfield on YouTube. And, um, you know, if, if you have a problem with the sound, uh, you know, downloading it, then that's your problem. So, uh, anyway, I'm sorry about the sound being uneven. Yeah, I really apologize. What it is. But, anyway, um, Ken, you wanted to still do a little bit of discussion. Oh, Kristen, you want to go? Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Oh, I turned that off. Um, Just turn it on. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm Krista Whitney. Uh, I am the director of the Wexler Oral History Project at the Yiddish Book Center. Um, and I want to just talk for, before I show my little video, a little bit about the project because um, the focus of the project is not actually the history of Jews in, in Western Massachusetts, but um, I did find a nice video that I think will fit into our discussion today that I'll show, but before I do that, um, so the, the book centers, um, the Yiddish Book Center's project is really looking at the place of Yiddish language and culture in today. So where do people connect to it? Um, what, where do, how do people find meaning in it? Where is it being spoken? And where is Yiddish language and culture being transmitted? Um, so so we, we look at various communities, performing arts as a way that, um, at, that Yiddish culture is being transmitted, family life, um, and uh, the academic community, which is a, is a, lot, a main place where people are coming to um, the Yiddish language. Um, as it's declining as a vernacular within um, a non-ultra-orthodox context. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, oral history projects generally fall into a few different categories. Um, the Ken's project um, and Jane's work are really community-based, which are, um, but the Yiddish Book Center's project is based around this theme of Yiddish language and culture, which is sort of by definition not placed in one geographic um, city, given the history of um, Yiddish-speaking um, Jews and the disbursement uh, throughout the diaspora. So that being said, um, I encourage you all, if you're interested in um, Yiddish language and culture, to check out our, um, our exhibit at the Yiddish Book Center or online. Um, I have some handouts if you have anyone who you think is a great candidate for our um, interviews. Um, but the video that I um, picked out today um, doesn't really have anything to do with Yiddish. Um, that's not really what we're talking about today. Um, but I think before I show this video, I just like to, um, you know, Ken's footage is about the history of the community. But I'd like to raise this um, idea that we are all living in a historical moment um, and one thing that you can do with oral history is to document people's memories of things as far back as they can remember. But another thing that we can do um, is be activist historians um, and keep the coming generations in mind and document what is going on in the community today. So the video that I have um, is, a, is about a pretty recent thing that happened in, the, in this community here at the JCA. Um, and I think it's interesting because it also raises some issues differences, um, relationship to history, and um, so I'll just just keep those in mind as we uh, as we watch this video. I'll see if I can get it. I'm too sorry, close. I didn't know sure. you were using this video. I apologize for oh, that's okay. Coming the book. I didn't. I felt like that was just grounding. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. 
short video that you guys saw before it. You guys heard if you want to. Yeah. Is there a story that everybody laughs at? Yes. Or is there a story? No. Well, do they have? Um, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. It was a Yankee Flipper. Yankee Flipper. Yeah. Yeah. Which was referring to. a lot more DVDs at the at Beverly Sugarloaf Street. We've got around 50 interviews of people in Springfield, some in Northampton, plus a lot of um, written interviews. So if you're interested further, just give a call, come visit, you can see them. There's a lot. And Frida Howard has prepared a video on the Jews and Amherst, so she gave us a copy of it too. I think, I don't, Jane would be, do you know that question? No, Has anyone been interviewed the Jews in Holyoke or Springfield? No. For a book or, or Greenfield, I'm sorry, Holyoke or Greenfield, yeah. In terms of all history, I mean, I know that in the Western Massachusetts book, there was, there was, I think Greenfield was touched on, right? Greenfield was. So there's informa information in Jane's book about Greenfield, um, but I don't think Holyoke. But uh, I will say that one thing that I found that was interesting about when I was going through all these uh, projects was the similarity in each town, you know. You know, the, the, how, when they moved, the types of jobs they had, the communities they built, and then, you know, the aftermath of it. So it's a similar kind of story, no matter whether you're in Springfield or Holyoke or Greenfield. So it was very interesting, yeah. transition, but I'm happy to introduce Jane Kaufman. I've already introduced her a little bit, um, and you might mention a little bit of the project and how this came about. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Project. A lot of people wonder what were my qualifications in doing this. In fact, I was one of the rabbis that I wanted to interview to ask him what themes should be included in this book. Had a whole list of questions to me, including what qualifies you to write this book? And what my answer to him was nothing, because I have never written a book. And in fact, I still haven't written a book. I edited this book. Um, the hardest job for me was to try to figure out how to includes synagogues in a way, and institutions, Jewish institutions. Um, I spent ages, it felt like ages, outline after outline after outline, trying to figure out the best organizational structure. And I want to credit Jane Trigier, who helped me realize that thematically would be the best way to do it. Um, so the book opens, as many of you may have already noticed, with a chapter on rituals. And because I thought that the most interesting part of the community, Jewish community isn't necessarily its history, which in some ways is very parallel to a lot of other ethnic histories. People face persecution, they come to America, or they hope they won't face persecution, then they face more persecution, and they deal with it in some way. That's kind of the broad brush outline. Um, so what I opened with rituals, which is really what makes Jews distinctive from other ethnic groups, is that we have a shared set of rituals. So it opens with, this, with a um, oral interview, and a lot of the book is oral interviews, of Henry Simkin, who was for many years the local and only Moyle in this area. The closest Moyles were in probably Worcester, West Hartford, and Albany. 
So he had he had a monopoly until I think maybe until Scott Siege moved into town, and Scott was in Amherst. So and then it moves on to bar mitzvah, and I did life cycle weddings and chavar katisha and funerals. I wanted to do something on divorce, but I couldn't find anyone who wanted to be interviewed about their get. So I did not include divorce. Um, from there, it moves on to a chapter about kashrut. And people have argued with me about whether or not the story about Harold Chernock actually belongs in, a, in the, in the um, chapter about kashrut. But Harold Chernock was a Springfield butcher. You're, you're nodding because you grew up in Springfield, Barbara. Um, and you remember him. He was a licensed commissioner who wielded with a very powerful fist. And he, um, he fought the city of Springfield's Sunday blue laws because he took Friday, Saturday, Friday evenings and Saturday hours off for Shabbat, or Shabbos as he probably called it. Yeah. And he wanted to be able to sell on Sundays. Well, that was antithetical to Massachusetts blue laws, which dated to, I think, 100 years prior to the Constitution. The US Supreme Court strangely ruled in favor of Springfield, and he was not allowed to open on Sundays for many years. And I don't know when he finally was able to open on Sundays, but he, he, he basically challenged those laws and lost. And that, that decision was included in a book um, edited by a guy named Joel Joseph and written by a guy named Joel Joseph, who happens to hail from my area, my neck of the woods. He's from Cleveland Heights originally. I'm from Shaker Heights, Ohio. And he now lives in LA. Um, he wrote, he's written a book called Worst Decisions of the Supreme Court, and he said that Harold <laughs> Chernock's decision will make the fourth edition. He said, I keep having to update it in order because the Supreme Court is makes such awful decisions. <laughs> this is all in the book. I'm not telling you anything that isn't in the book. Um, the, one, of the, one of the pieces I was most excited about working on appears in the third chapter, and that is the piece with Sheila, um, your former rabbi. Um, I wanted to, to do a piece, and this I felt that this would be a great way to draw together um, Western Massachusetts Ju Judaism and, and Jewish communities by t focusing on the four pioneering, in my opinion, pulpit women rabbis. So that piece features Joyce Galaski, Sheila, Sheila Peltz Weinberg, Deborah Zecher, who's in Great Barrington, and um, Amy Walk Katz in Springfield. So I did not include in that piece Nancy, Nancy um, Plam, whom I consider to be sort of my personal rabbi right now. But, um, and people have said to me, is Nancy in the book now? <laughs> um, but, but those other four women are. Um, rather than to read to you from it, which I thought I might do, I feel like you might be a bit taxed from having to wait, but I would be happy to read a short piece if you are interested. Um, otherwise, I'll just kind of, kind of continue this yarn. Does this better? Okay. Um, I was also, so I was daunted about how to handle synagogues generally. And I real, finally realized that, that writing about synagogues was gonna be a complete bore to most people, that nobody cared about anyone else's synagogue history except their own, if they, if they are affiliated, have a synagogue, and care about its history. Now, I really do care about my own personal synagogue's history. I belong to the congregation of Israel and have since I moved here. But, um, and I, th I have a very strong connection there. But I'm also a wanderer, and I have showed up at services here. So if I look familiar to you, it's because I occasionally come over the bridge to say hi to Irv and Linda and um, meet them here, but, um, and, and other friends here. So, so while I am interested in synagogue history generally, I realize that most people probably would not, and that it would end up being a bricks and mortar recount of like how people raise money to build things. And I thought, that's gotta be the most boring thing to read. The same goes for institutions. I felt that writing an institutional history of say, the Jewish nursing home would just about kill everyone who read it. So instead of writing that kind of history, I decided to do a, a chapter, by the way, Jane Trigere beautifully wrote a piece on the, histories of, on the history of synagogues in Springfield, most of, most of which, as you know, have disappeared. And that seems important to me, and I'm glad that she did that. That was a big contribution. She had done previously a piece for a master's thesis on the architecture of those synagogues. But she, in doing so, and also in doing this project, she and Ken um, uh, explored the history of those communities. And so she was able to write a really beautiful piece. I still cannot keep straight the names of all the synagogues in Springfield. I can't even tell you how many there were. Um, but Jane knows. And so she was able to write a really good piece about that. Um, regarding the institutions, I decided the best way to handle the big Jewish institutions in Springfield would be to write a piece about each of them, but focusing on one particularly interesting program. 
So the Jewish Federation was really the hardest one for me. I was like, what am I going to do with that? I ended up doing a, a piece about Rachel's table, and that seemed like a really nice way of, of, of showcasing them. For the JCA, there's a piece about their um, inclusion camp for kids with disabilities called, called Kahiwa. That is that, that, that's that initiative there. And, and, the, and so I focus on a couple kids and a couple counselors and about how that whole effort works. Um, Let's see, for, for um, Jewish Family Services, which, is, which has got such a central position in immigration, I talked with Bob Marmor, and he and I agreed that focusing on an, one Iraqi refugee who now works for JFS, but had immigrated with the help of JFS, would make sense. So that person is the only Muslim centerpiece in the book. Um, I wanted to focus on rabbis who I really like and respect. And there were two that came to mind um, immediately. And they were Yehiel Lander. And, um, and so I got a chance to talk with him and, and about his history here, um, but also his, his efforts at starting the Land of Rinspoon Academy in Northampton. And the other rabbi who I really wanted to showcase was Rabbi Jerome Gerland. So I did real interviews with those guys. and. And by the way, I'll tell you this, and I have not told any other audience this. This is a yearbook. All of the pieces in here who have living people interviewed in them, whom I could find, those pieces have all been vetted. So this is not pure journalism. This is public relations. But I will also tell you this. People didn't change much. So if they wanted to change their quotations, I was like, fine. I would never do that in a news story. I work for the newspaper. Um, and this was a project of the newspaper. But their, their changes were so slight that, it, in, in fact, I feel like it really is a piece of journalism. I just wanted to, I, I feel like it's good to come clean with that and with an educated audience. Um, so Rabbi Jerome Gerland and Rabbi Yechiel Lander and everyone else who appears in this book, and I advise every, all of the other contributors to it to do the same, to, to, to submit their finished pieces to, their, to the people who were their, supposed to, their narrators or their sources and ask them to make sure that it, they were comfortable and that it felt accurate. And as I said, most of the changes were minor. But I think everyone felt better about, about doing it this way. This way, there are far fewer inaccuracies. I was most, much more worried about, about having inaccuracies than I was about having missing some truth. So, so the, there is, I think, a great deal of truth in here. I would like to read one piece. Um, I want to read a piece um, about uh, snobbery in the Jewish community in Springfield. So how am I doing for time? Who's timing? I think we're fine. Okay, so I just feel like having seen this piece, um, that it might be instructive and interesting. Do you want to hold that microwave? Um, thank you. That would be fantastic. So most of my most of the pieces in the book have one source. This is one of the few that actually has many. I believe it's on seventy page seventy. So if you're holding the book, I think I think this is on page seventy seven. And you're welcome to, to follow along with me. Yes, it's called In Jewish Communities Hierarchies, In Jewish Community Hierarchies Emerge. So most, most, well, I'm gonna just read. Just because Springfield's Jews weren't on the top of the social heap in the early 20th century and experienced a fair degree of anti-Semitism didn't mean that they couldn't establish their own pecking order. In many American cities, German Jews who were often affiliated with the greatly assimilated reform movement rose to the top of the heap. Springfield's population of largely Eastern European Jews established Orthodox synagogues, and social divisions began to arise between neighborhoods rather than ethnicity. The North End, which was settled first, had the first synagogues on Gray's Avenue, Dwight, and Congress Streets. For decades, it featured many of the necessities and luxuries of Jewish life, delicatessens, bakeries, butchers, and kosher restaurants. Housing was crowded. I think a lot of people originated on Bell Street, said Evelyn Barron, who lived there as a child. It was not just Jews. We were Anglo, Syrians, Polish people, Americans, and Irish. We moved three times on Bell Street. In the first move, the family downsized from five to four rooms in order to save $8 per week to send her brothers to college. I always slept in the same room as my brother, she said. I didn't know any different. I slept in a crib till I was eight years old. It was a brown metal crib, and if I saw it today, I would know it. We remained in the North End, Barron said. 
A bulk of the people moved to Forest Park. Fellows from Forest Park did not want to date girls from the North End. <laughs> Families moved to Forest Park thinking they would better themselves. We couldn't. My father was a house painter. Irving Gold's father had a store, Gold's Creamery, on Ferry Street. He used to make his own butter, Gold said. He had a churn in back. He used to get his milk and cream from a farmer in Vermont. It was just before Pesach. He had his front windows displayed with Passover goods. Somebody blew it up. That was in 30, 1932, April. His father chose to start over in a more upscale neighborhood, the X, at Dickinson, Belmont, and Sumner Avenues. When we were down on Ferry Street, it was kosher, Gold said, but when we were in the park, he snuck in a few non-kosher items, displayed some hams, and got some non-Jewish customers. <laughs> Still, just because Forest Park was a wealthier neighborhood did not mean it was not necessarily more hospitable to Jews than the North End. Seymour Frankel was born in the North End. His family moved to Trafton Road on the edge of Forest Park when he was just a year old. There were just so many things we couldn't do, he said. On Trafton Road, there was only one non-Jewish family, the Kellys, and they would always find the Jewish boys and beat us up. <laughs> like many people of his generation, he remembers being insulted in junior high and high school. Still, he remembered being called the snobbery of the Forest Park Jews. There was a great division between what was still the North End and Forest Park, he said. Some of the people living up here in Forest Park just didn't want to have anything to do with the North End people. Frankel fought the social distinctions among Jews when he had the opportunity as a student at classical high school. When it came to dances, I would always call a girl from the North End. They may not have been as fortunate, but they certainly were as nice as we were. That is, that's it for me. Thank you. You guys ready? I'd like to just make some observations. I've been thinking about today and some of the work we did in Springfield. So some brief observations before we open it up for discussion. And I think the observations may lead to some further discussion. One of the things I was thinking about is, how does one define what is a Jewish community? What is a Jewish community? What makes it Jewish? How, did, how does it evolve? How does it perpetuate itself? What keeps it going? That's a really key question. And that was a key question we faced in Springfield with the closing of at least three synagogues, the merging into one. You know, what keeps what keeps a synagogue going? Now, I'm not that familiar, frankly, with Amherst. That's what you're here for today, partly. But I think Amherst and you know, Northampton are very untraditional in terms of the Jews moving up here as compared to Springfield. Springfield, the Jews moved here basically in the 1880s, uh, 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, same thing in Hartford, 1860s, 1860s. And most of them were Russian Jews. And they came from the same shtetls, they brought each other community. And they all lived together, you know, around Ferry Street in the beginning. And as they got more wealthy, they moved to from the uh, uh, north end to Forest Park. And then from Forest Park, what happened? Longer. They moved to Long Meadow, and Forest Park has begun to, you know, see changes too, right? So it's a very close knit community. I think Amherst was far more as a um, in some ways, I think, as refugees from urban settings came up to me, let's be in the country. I think that's more like it. And I think the university, please you'll correct me if I'm wrong, was one of the major draws that brought Jews here in the beginning. And then more and more Jews came here to go to the university, and they stayed on. And Jane has an expression, which is, Amherst is made up of professors, poets, potters, and potheads. <laughs> anyway, so it's just an expression. But I think in some ways, being up in Amherst and Northampton is You've got to be a little bit more, I wouldn't use the word assimilate, but much more with the world as compared to being in Springfield, where if you're Orthodox, you live close to each other and you live close to the shul because you can't drive on Shabbos. Whereas here, we're much more of a, a car community. We're driving around, we're more suburban. So this is a very big difference with Amherst and Northampton and uh, Springfield. And I wonder, you can tell me, when the Jews moved to Amherst and Northampton, did they tend to congregate together in the same neighborhoods or did they just spread out helter-skelter randomly, or were there some kind of hidden, quiet, restrictive covenants in the beginning which kept Jews out? I've heard things like that in Northampton. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard about that. Um, but the Jewish community is very diverse, especially in Amherst. We all know that. They're Jews who are gastronomical Jews. They're musical Jews. They're religious Jews. They're bar mitzvah Jews. There are all kinds of Jews here. It's hard to define what is a Jewish community. But we all know that when a Jewish community gets started in an area, what's the first thing they put up? What's the first Cemetery. thing? Cemetery. Cemetery. 
Is that true for Amherst? Tell me. Yeah. Okay. Yes. First thing is the seven. No. Sunday school was first. Okay, so we'll discuss that. I'd like to hear about that. All right, we can talk about that. So the cemetery is the first thing. Then the social clubs in some ways, and like help self help groups often, and then the synagogues. And so, sometimes the synagogues start out as meeting in someone's home or meeting in a hall. And that happened in Springfield too in the beginning. Until you get some money, which brings us to the next question, which is how do you fund these things? How do you fund buildings? Now in Springfield, the guys started out as peddlers, literally, you know, packs on their backs, and they went out. Eventually, they were able to open up little shops. But most of them were peddlers. And they were businessmen, and a lot of them were very successful. And it's the businessmen who were the pillars of the community, and they supported the shuls. Why did the shuls go down in, Spring, in, in Springfield, let's say, 10 years ago? Why did it start to happen? I think partly because the businessmen no longer had the same kind of funding, and they weren't able to support them anymore in the way they were able to in terms of all the bills. They built some really enormous buildings. So that's a major question in terms of who's supporting the Jewish community. And in Springfield, it was the businessmen in the beginning. We heard a lot of stories about all the very successful guys who started out with nothing and really worked hard to do it. Now, the next point to that is, in Springfield, the children of these businessmen stayed. And, you know, from the 1920s, 1930s, and they continued the businesses often. Father and son, mother, daughter, whatever. But you know, they continued the businesses. That's very important. Why is that important? Because the leadership remained in the same family too. The head of the shul, father to son, let's say. Hadassah. You could count on the children to continue and stay in the community. What happened with the Second World War? After the Second World War, you had the GI Bill. The guys came back and they went off to college and they no longer wanted to be merchants and shopkeepers or what have you, they became doctors and lawyers. And the rabbi here, his, his stepfather, his step, uh, Dr. Hafez, his father was a rag picker, you know, a, a paper guy. That's what he did for a living. And what is Dr. Hafez, he's a, a surgeon. The guys got the GI Bill, they went to college, and they got educated, and they did not remain in the community. That's very important. The question I would pose to all of you is, how many of your kids are going to remain in the Western Massachusetts, and how many are going to move away? And if they do come back, what draws them back besides the grandchildren issue, which I think is very powerful? But my concern is that a lot of the kids we see nowadays go on. They go out into the world, and it's constantly in transition. And how do you keep the Jewish community vibrant with all kinds of newcomers, which is a big issue, but I think that's very true. Whereas in Springfield, it was very different. I think another issue we face here has to do with the cost of housing. If my kid would want to move to Northampton or Atlas, it's very expensive now. You really need to have a very powerful job. I mean, that's a real issue in terms of bringing more people here. That's why a lot of people move up here coming from New York, I think, and they're selling their apartment, whatever. You know, so it's a very different world than it was when I moved here in the early 80s. Uh, also, you know, in Springfield, as I said, the Jews live close together. And I think out here, and you can correct me, I think it's much more spread out, more diverse community. Now, the other question I'd like to ask for discussion is, where do you shop? If you're looking for kosher food, let's say, or Jewish style food, where do you go now? And where would you go? How often did you go to Springfield? Was that where you went? Did you go to Ferry Street? No, maybe not Ferry Street. You go to, you know, where did you go to shop? I know that Stop and Shop now has Empire and, uh, you know, kosher food and they have, you know, herring and whatever. But where would you shop if you were looking for that? Are there delis that you would go to? Well, Trader Joe. Huh? Trader Joe. Trader Joe. Nice <laughs> <laughs> uh, Now, it's interesting also that Stop and Shop for Passover has a major Passover session, right? No. That's a very good one. That's community pressure, I think. They, they Stop and Shop was a Jewish store in the old days. Was. Yeah. No. Yes. It was? Yeah. It was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, now, the other issue, the other issue is the merchants, the merchants in Springfield, you know, they, they all, a lot of shops, Jewish shops. In Northampton, in the 1940s and 50s, even, 
There are a lot of Jewish merchants up and down Main Street. A lot. Now, tell me today, are there many Jewish merchants in downtown Amherst or in Northampton? I don't know. If there are, are they identified as Jews? Would you say, oh, the guy who owns that is Jewish and da 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 or it's Jewish food or whatever. I think it's a very different world in terms of the merchants, whereas, whereas back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, you could go down to certain streets and there'd be a lot of Jewish merchants there. Um, oh, there's another issue which I think is very interesting in terms of the evolution of the Jewish community, which I think we face here, I think they face in Northampton, I think they face somewhat in Springfield too, and that is one of the purposes of establishing a synagogue is what? What's one of the basic purposes? Education. Education, the future of your generation, right? What else? What? Life cycle. Life cycle, what else? Why do people basically establish a synagogue? Sure. Community. Community, what else? Services. Services, to pray. Wasn't the reason originally to set up a synagogue to pray? Let's get together and they would pray every day or twice a day and shopping up. That was the original intent, I think, at least in Springfield, let's say, with the Orthodox communities, very much it was that we get together, we pray, that's what we do, and we see each other Friday night and Saturday. It's a big issue now here, Northampton, and parts of Springfield, to get lenient. What's happened? What's happened to the evolution of a concept of synagogue and prayer? I don't know if that's relevant for us today, but that's an important point to think about in terms of the future. And there's some other things, but I'll leave it for now. So I hope this opens up some further discussion. Thank you. Jew crew on it. 
and they went to school with that stuff. Um, one teacher said, made, the, made a kid take the stuff off. Another teacher smiled and said, wow, well, hey, that's really cool. Um, you can imagine that there was a bit of a hullabaloo afterwards, after the, the parents found out about it. And the principal, Mike Hayes, his response was, this is really interesting. If you do it again, maybe you could tell the kids what's going to the other students in the school what it means. So when you do it, they'll understand. It. He saw this. He was aware of the controversy, and his attitude was, "Well, the way we can make it not a controversy is let's bring everybody in on it and tell everybody what's going on." And I thought that was a great response, as opposed to you know, let's avoid controversy, don't do it again. So I was really impressed with his response. Um, unfortunately, the kids didn't do it again. So his the principal's uh, plan never uh, had a follow through on it. But the parents in the JCA also had a huge, wide range of opinion. Um, and many of the parents, most of us actually, most of the parents of the seventh graders met. And one woman said that her father was in tears when he heard it. Um, he just couldn't understand. We have a friend who's a child spy that's a Holocaust. And she, she said to my wife, he was like, that's wonderful, good for them, that's marvelous. Ah, yeah, she was thrilled that they were taking ownership of this instead of avoiding it, avoiding it. Avoiding the statements, it's sort of like the, the, you know, the gays taking over the pink triangle, which during the Holocaust had been a sign of shame, and now it's a sign of pride. And so, you know, and you saw this as how wonderful. And the parents, my attitude was great, good for them, you know. But a lot of the parents who were raised Jewish, they didn't understand why anyone would want to make a point of calling attention to themselves. And so, oh, uh, several parents expressed the, um, uh, the uh, ambivalence of really proud and happy that their kids feel safe enough to say, hey, I'm Jewish and I'm having a bar mitzvah tomorrow. But on the other hand, still sort of recoiling because when they were a kid, they would never have felt safe doing that. So I think that's a... I think that story paints a picture of what it's like to be Jewish in that Um, well, I'm actually not sure the year that this, this is not. A couple of years ago. It was a few years ago? Three years ago. Maybe. Oh, three years ago? Yeah. Oh, so it's very recent. Uh, like a year or two before Nathan Harmon, so which was two years ago. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just think it's interesting through that example that you see the different reactions to is Jewish identity public or private? Um, how is Jewish identity expressed in different ways across different generations um, as the, um, you know, the community um, around the Jewish community changes through different periods of history. Um, and then also with this particular um, case, how, how does the relationship to the memory of um, persecution and particularly the Holocaust change across generations. What is, what is um, the you know second, third generation um, past the Holocaust? What is the relationship to history? Um, how is that different? And how does that make earlier generations uncomfortable, proud? Um, you know, I just think that's sort of some questions that we should think about when we're talking about Ken's questions of. Um, how to keep a community.
community going. Yeah. in the, I guess, now old Jewish tradition that you don't deface your body in that way, but also because I felt that our forebears, some of whom are still among us, were forced to have tattoos, and this would be a mocking thing. Then my daughter showed me an article, which I think might have been in Hadassah magazine, but I'm not sure, where young Jews, young Jewish adults and teens were doing that taking over of the tattoo. And they were, um, I think one had his grandfather's number tattooed on them, and others had Hebrew lettering tattooed on them. And they were making that argument with me. And somehow, I actually won this one, which is really unusual. Um, <laughs> it probably involves some sort of bribe. But um, they, I think they really got it that I don't ask that much for them. And it was really important to me because I, I personally felt it was just not respecting the horrible persecution. Yeah, I'm saying that I think all of this has come up because I think that there's they have like a sort of panel thing, and I'm 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 just here because I'm officially supposed to be moderating it, but there's no moderation required. You guys are fine, so. <laughs> so I wanted to respond to this. Oh, but maybe you did. There was a couple of weeks ago a class from Deerfield, and I don't know the difference between South Deerfield and North, so I can't say that, but this teacher came and the kids were not just walking through, oh, this is interesting. This, they were sitting down, they were learning, they were, they were really seeing what Judaism is. And I, it was at the Yiddish Book Center, and I was so impressed that these teachers wanted to give these kids a real idea of the Holocaust, but who are these people? And doing it in a positive, caring way. And so I, I would like to see more of the schools, Amherst and such, following this kind of even, and, not, and not just with Jews, but, but with a way that kids can feel proud about themselves and comfortable with those who are not. Do you want to respond first? No, I think it's important that other people respond before. I think, unfortunately, when it comes to multiculturalism, Jews and Judaism don't seem to fit. So we're sort of not a minority anymore in most people's estimation. That's my opinion. I came today because I was interested in people telling their stories. I don't care what you call your tribe or your people, whether you're Irish or whether you're Catholic from Philadelphia. The stories need to be told. And if you're going to look to a monolithic public school system to do it, not happening. The secularization is, well, in your stories, it's generational and it's a secularization of society that it's made it difficult to have a conversation. So unless we all decide our stories are important and tell them to our children's children, they will be lost. It, it's not going to happen. There's too much political correctness in public schools. So I encourage everyone, tell your stories to your family. I also, uh, I also live in Deerfield, where Ken lives, and I have some friends, young students that live in my immediate neighborhood. And so I know that Frontier Regional, which is both middle school and high school, they have whole units on the Holocaust because my neighbor comes to talk to me and she was so enthused studying it. Might be the same group of people. Might be. I was so impressed it, with it, the teachers and the kids though. It, it's fantastic. Whereas other towns in the valley, like East Hampton, 
they had a pile of Holocaust literature from Ken. They were in the process of throwing it out. When I walked into the library, I had been teaching there, and I said, uh, with, a, with about 100 National Geographics, and I was like, I will take all of this. And then, they, then I saw the Holocaust literature, and I had to act. I will take all of this, too. So I was able to retrieve the incredibly wonderful and probably rare books that Ken and Jane had left with the East Hampton Public Schools. Before we get too far on field, I just wanted to respond to actually the video. Um, so I have a similar story about actually the title of my book. Um, yeah, that went through several iterations. I'm not going to re repeat the entire story, but I want to let you know that the use of the word Jews became an issue mm. in the title. And I actually proposed a question to my mother. Do you find that offensive in this context? And she said, I do. Wow. So, Say to Jewish people or something, yeah. sort of, you know, add the ish, it's a little less charged. It is. It's it's so, but it's not so right. I really felt it was important to reclaim it. And finally, the way to win the argument with the most vociferous um, uh, opponent of that, using that word, I was able to find this This was a stroke of genius on the part of Joe Carvalho, who was a lead contributor mm -hmm. in the book. So, look at that Hartford history. What, did, what word do they use? Jews, and that. I, I wrote a letter, a very pointed letter, saying we need to reclaim this language. And there is nothing inherently um, negative about the word Jews. It's only in the context of dirty Jews that it becomes dirty. So, anyway. Jewish West Hartford. Starting over the formation of the Jews of uh, Springfield, and this one written the by Jews uh, the, yeah. the Jews of Paradise. There was no issue there, right? I just want to say one quick comment about the Holocaust and teaching the Holocaust. It's kind of distressing if you think that the outside world, how are they learning about Jews by studying the Holocaust? That's not exactly how I want the outside world to know about Jewish life and Jewish people today. We want to honor the Holocaust, but we don't want that to be the major focus of what people are learning about the Jews. That was the purposeful destruction of our people. So I want, I mean, I, the PC thing is, would public school kids come to a synagogue? I don't know. Will, it, will they take kids to churches? I don't know. It's a whole area that's not being explored. I mean, how do you know your neighbor? In the old days, you used to go to a service of your, of your friend and you'd see what they were doing. But I certainly wouldn't want the Holocaust to be the emphasis of what Jewish education is. And I know you're at Frontier, you're right, they have a whole Holocaust curriculum. It's I don't think they have any Jewish Wars. curriculum, huh? It's connected to World War II. Yeah, but still. But the diary of Anne Frank is how some people begin to understand about the Yeah. I just wanted to say that Amherst, Amherst was one of the first communities in the country to have the Holocaust in the curriculum, courtesy of Mr. Gerstein, was it Mark Gerstein, who died this year. And all our kids took that course when they were in Amherst High School. Of Yiddish, Jewish culture. Jew, Jewish culture. He just wrote a book, and he's he's getting all kinds of speaking engagements and awards and such. The name of it is um, Jews and Roosevelt. Okay. His name is Brightman, Richard Brightman. Oh, sure. I just want to say there's a geometry teacher at the Amherst High School. His name is Mr. Friedman. And as part of his early in the year geometry, he um, brings in this apple peeler where you put the apple on and you turn it and he peels the apple and then he lets them eat it with honey. And he talks about the geometry of something to do with the apple core. And he also tells them why he decided to bring in apples and honey. And I'm kind of surprised that he didn't get flack about it, but I guess he does it every year. And I, I like that. It's a good yeah. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Probably he was describing it. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so one thing I want to say is I think if we were to interview youth, 
across the valley, it would be a really interesting thing. I know that my niece and nephew in the Williamsburg schools experienced anti-Semitism, direct anti-Semitism. In Belchertown, I think we literally figured out that, you know, if there are, um, you know, if you take 100% of kids growing up in Belchertown, 80% of them are in intermarried families. And so their interaction is different, and their interaction when they get to the JCA with the Amherst Jewish kids is a whole thing. Um, so I'm interested in those intersections, and I wanted to ask you, Jane, about what you learned about the institutions that were connecting through the Council of Churches, the Jewish War Veterans, the City of Homes, those things in Springfield that were trying to be connected to the rest of the community, if you have any stories. I unfortunately did not explore that issue okay. at all. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has, or if there's anyone in the audience who can respond to your question, but I didn't go there. I had too much to, to just cover in terms of to go to the interfaith questions. But I will say this, um, regarding the issue of anti-Semitism, most of the people I interviewed were over the age of 70, not all of them, but, but all the people I interviewed over the age of 70 had experienced and, and it didn't matter where they were from. They could have been from Germany, in, living in Germany at the time of Kristallnacht, or they could have been living in Holyoke, or in, um, I interviewed somebody who I think grew up in like Brockton. It, it didn't matter. Everyone experienced anti-Semitism at least once, and it was usually from another kid, and usually it, was a, it would involve physical violence, but not always. It often involved the words dirty Jew, and it was chilling to every one of them. It, it only took one incident. Once they were here, you're saying they. No, it, it, I'm not saying that. I'm saying wherever they were as children, it didn't matter if they were in Germany or if they were in Brockton or if they were in Holyoke or if they were in Springfield. Almost everyone I interviewed had an anti Semitic traumatic incident in their memory that they related to me. Yeah, I want to get back to this uh, issue of. Um, how people identify Jewishly, because uh, I think for the older generation, the people you interviewed, um, you, you, the parts of the videotape that we saw, for them, uh, for a lot of them, it was identification through the synagogue, through the shul. But um, in recent surveys that have been done with younger people, they don't identify religiously. But they, when people ask them, the surveyors ask them, do you identify Jewishly? They say yes, and it's through the culture. They have no problem saying, I'm Jewish and I'm proud of being Jewish, but not necessarily religiously. So um, that's very interesting. I think the real issue, it's, it's uh, fascinating to me that a lot of Israelis don't identify Jewishly. They say, I'm Israeli, I'm not necessarily Jewish. Because for them, what we see as Jewish identity, although not necessarily religiously, they see as part of their national identity. Purim's a national holiday, Pesach is a national holiday. You know, they see those things as part of their national identity, they don't necessarily see it as Jewish identity. And that to me is absolutely fascinating. Young people here say, I'm not religious, but I'm Jewish. So, and, and they see it as a cultural identity. So I, I, th I find those differences absolutely fascinating. And the, the young people here see themselves as part of the Jewish community, but not religiously. So an interesting difference between Springfield and Amherst is that um, in, in the 1920s, there was one Jewish family in Amherst. And so what it was like to be a Jewish student at the university at that time um, <clears throat> was, uh, is revealed actually in, in the papers of someone who was a student and came back to be a professor. His name is Max Goldberg. There's quite a lot of detail there. Have you seen it, David? About Uh huh. Yeah. So they the they would um, be invited by this family to come for Passover. The few Jewish students that there were, and uh, 
and there was um, some question as time went on about whether the president ought to allow a Jewish fraternity to be formed. And he wrote to uh, college presidents all over the country about whether or not he ought to do this. I'm not sure what his fear was. Um, it may have been some paternalistic thing for their own good that they should be you know, spread out or, uh, anyway, it was really interesting. But um, I think the fact that there are not long generations of Jews in Amherst the way there are in Springfield affects how it feels to be a member of this synagogue where if you've come from one that felt that was made up of generations and here we have all come together newly um, in our own generation to form this synagogue and it feels very different. I mean, I've been, I guess, in Western Mass since 1986, so that's a long time, I guess, and uh, grew up in the Philadelphia area. And one of the things that really has always struck me about the Jewish community in Amherst and Western Mass is on the one hand, there may not be all that many Jews in Western Mass, but on the other hand, almost all these families have some tie to New York or to Boston or to Hartford uh, I'm stretching a little bit down to go to Philadelphia, but I'm thinking about this in terms of Jewishness, that a lot of people will visit grandparents who'll be, you know, maybe two hours away instead of living next door. But it, it, it's kind of, thanks to the automobile, it's a little more geographically dispersed, but, but there are connections that a lot of the people in Western Mass have to the more urban, established, long-time Jewish communities, even though they themselves aren't, like, inside of one, literally inside of Amherst. So that's just one comment. I have another very brief comment that I want to make, just because I'm thinking of it. Um, and that is, Jane, when you mentioned the oral histories, because we teach oral history at UMass, you know, I'm in the history department. And one of the things that is really standard practice is that after you do the interview and you get a transcript, you give it back to the person, they have a chance to make corrections and additions and all that, and that's what you go with. And so we may, you know, I mean, that's just sort of good, good manners. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, what you were doing, even though it may have felt a little uncomfortable for a journalist, in fact, is for an oral historian. Standard. Uh, standard, and, and, and actually the Oral History Association has standards and say that's actually something you're supposed to do. When, when trans, I'll just, the caveat of that is that when you're transcribing an interview. So it's actually different within the um, standards of the field if you're doing um, the, and this is actually a big debate within the yeah. larger oral history association now whether, um, you know, what is the original? Is it the recording or, yeah. you know, when you edit it, what do you need to keep the original and in what form? And so I think. It's, yeah, but that is really an interesting issue of whether, um, I mean, for example, for our interviews, we don't, you can't really vet a, a video in the same no. way you can text. So, so it is in, it's different as, as the medium changes. Yeah. No, that's very true. First of all, I think it would be mean-spirited if we didn't congratulate Jane on her achievement. So wonderful achievement, Jane. <laughs> Secondly, uh, we have to quote Shelley in saying that although heard songs are sweet, those unheard are sweeter. And there are many who many songs of the area that have yet to be heard. So we hope that this will be the first edition. I, I'd like to uh, I join with you about telling stories about our neighborhood. And uh, one of the stories I'd like to tell would be to uh, uh, expand the notion that all of the immigrants who came to Western Massachusetts turned out to be butchers and tailors and uh, there is an interesting story about one immigrant family called the Levin family that came to Northampton. And they apparently were post-1905 revolutionary uh, survivors. And Louis, Levin was described to me as being one of those Russian Jewish intellectuals who smoked a cigarette through a cigarette holder. And they were very much uh, dismissive of the orthodox uh, 
the small town Jewish community. And so Louis Levin set up a Louis Levin fund whose uh, interest was to be dedicated to Jewish cultural issues other than the synagogue. No. When I arrived as a uh, former kibbutznik, who else would be appropriate for the, the board of directors of a non-synagogue <laughs> directed fund? And we uh, dedicated money to issues having to do with Jewish cultural events. Among them a lecture by uh, the late uh, uh, Baskin and other of the sort. But I think the, probably the most important thing that the Louis XI Fund did was since I was also then the, <laughs> among my official duties, the vice president of the board of directors of the then very tiny Yiddish book center, I was, may, I was able to make available $1,000 for the Yiddish book center. And that gave the Yiddish book center its first housing in Florence, which as I, <laughs> as I recall was an unheated uh, uh, basement to a pottery shop but anyway, but I, I simply want to point out that there were more than butchers and bakers, <laughs> and that uh, the Levin Fund, which lasts till a few years ago, sparked, as I say, Jewish cultural events other than the synagogue. But I have to tell you a secret, but somehow the synagogue got a, a projector and a, uh, all kinds of other educational events, but of course they weren't religious, it was a projector. <laughs> I just wanted to mention um, my, my field is uh, at the moment uh, writing fiction and uh, Level as Press has published my novel last year. Um, uh, what I want to bring up is the fact that one of the top 100 novels ever written or you know written and highly treasured uh, was written by an Irishman about a Jew. And he made this Jew such a wonderful guy that you wish you knew him, Le Leopold Bloom. And James Joyce is the Irishman who wrote the novel. And of course, he made himself very famous. And with the help of American publishers, he finally made a few bucks on the book. Uh, that's about all. I, I, I had a little to say about folklore, you know. Uh, Irish folklore and Jewish folklore, uh, two things that fascinate me. I grew up on Irish folklore. My mother was from Ireland and told me stories. But I found similar stories in Isaac Singer and um, so forth. And, you know, they are enough. Everybody has the same stories. This congregation has probably the foremost Rebbe, who's also a Joyce scholar. Yes. <laughs> so the question I would also then stay with is if, if we're a lot of cultural Jews, if that's what's happened in terms of the next generation, can that perpetuate itself? Can being culturally Jewish perpetuate itself to the next generation and the next generation? What is the glue? that holds us together as a Jew, that keeps it going? I mean, that's really a significant question in terms of you know, community. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out, Linda, this is a very new community where a lot of us are just refugees, so to speak, from other areas. It's all new. It's not founded in 1890 or 1900 or, eight, you know, we're really new. And how do we keep it strong and our kids continue it? That for me is really the, or is it constant turnover and new interests and new, you know? I think something we haven't talked about, having a good rabbi is very important in terms of binding a community and getting people to come to shul for whatever reason they come, be it cultural or religious. You need someone who can inspire you. I think that's really important in terms of a community. Do you want to say something? Um, your question is something I've thought about a lot, and now we have spread out geographically generation by generation. 
we're safer than we've been in, in this country than anywhere. So I think as we start to spread out, some of the forces that held us together from the outside have changed. And I think that's part of the complication of the question. In addition to the safety allowing for greater assimilation in the larger culture. And so then the question is, do we come together as Jews in future generations because we have to or because we want to? And what keeps that whatever Judaism is alive enough that people still want to do it. And so I think when I think of Judaism right now and I think of Jewish renewal and the kind of, from my frame, re-spiritualization of Judaism from the inside out, that to me is one of the new directions that I think can help Jews rebirth as communities. And the lessons of history are that you can be um, a German Jew, a French Jew, a Dutch Jew, and when things come to a bad end, like we'll see what happens with Ukraine right now, the Jews are always the ones who suffer. I mean, that's my take on things. So I think we can never be too comfortable as Jews anywhere. Yeah, I think I'd like to uh, sort of comment on the last two comments. I think it's really important that we we help um, folks understand that we're connected to the rest of the Jewish community outside of the United States because we also are seeing an increase in the rise of anti-Semitism in other countries. And we can feel very comfortable about being here even though we see little incidences of anti-Semitism even in this country. But we also know that one of the largest um, immigrations to Israel, Aliyah to Israel in the last few years has been from France to Israel, from French Jews who've lived in France for many generations. Um, and continuously we're seeing, hearing more anti-Semitic acts in other countries in Europe. So I think it's important that we help the younger generation of Jews in this country connect with what's happening to our Jewish communities in other countries. Because we may feel safe, comparatively speaking, but there's the rest of the world. And they need to understand that we are connected to those Jews as well. So I think the last two comments were really important, and yes, the Ukraine is starting to talk about the Jews in Ukraine, and that a lot of the problems in Ukraine now have to do with the Jews. So it's really important that we be aware and we pass that awareness onto our children, our young adult children, our adult children that may not be the synagogue, but we need to reconnect them to the Jewish community at large in the rest of the world. Southern Poverty Law Center. And, um, no, no, you tell. <laughs> How many hate groups are there in this country? Um, numbers around 1,200 or so. Uh, actually, the incidence of anti Semitism in the U.S. has declined slightly by a percent or two over the last year or so. Um, but if you. But, if you actually go online, you can see uh, an enormous spiking in the online presence of, of anti-Semitism in America. Um, I, think, I think American Jews are in a, in a position now that Jews have not found themselves in for a few thousand years, and we are enjoying the best situation that Jews have had uh, in those two millennia. But I think it's temporary. And I don't want to sound like some, some downer, but I think if you, if you are aware of Jewish history, you know that all of these good periods ultimately come to an end. Um, that doesn't mean that at, at the moment we shouldn't be looking at Amherst Jewish history and everything else. Uh, I, one thing I just want to add, totally unrelated, 
You may not know this, uh, and there's no reason you should, but if you look at the stained glass windows in, in the chapel, you see the Dickinson family name there. You might be interested to know that the two descendants of the Dickinsons are Jewish. Uh, yes, uh, they, uh, because they are our niece and nephew. That's how I know. <laughs> uh, so so we, we sometimes look at, at the American Jewish experience and the uh, the loss of, of Jews into the larger population and huge concern over what's happening with all that, I don't think that's, in, in my opinion, I don't think that's a major problem. Uh, if you're like, it all depends on how you go about defining who is a Jew. And in a community like the JCA, where there is so much intermarriage going on and, and the children of intermarried couples, um, I, if you actually take a look at the numbers of, of Jews in America, that number is going up. Uh, and it's, it's really not because of immigration. It's, it's because of, of, of some of the intermarriage that's going on and the children from all of that. After all, if two Jews marry and have two children, there are two more Jews. If two Jews marry non-Jews and have children, and the potential for those children to be Jewish, uh, you know, again, the figures are all over the place, but at least a third or more of those children uh, and, and I can tell you, I don't want to monopolize this, but I can tell you as someone who teaches Jewish history over at UMass, uh, most of my students are not Jewish, and, and the majority of the Jewish students I have come from intermarried families. And so th those numbers are, are sort of interesting to watch. Um, you might want to you know, think about that in terms of taking any kind of history of, of the Jews in Amherst and Northampton and elsewhere. I just want to um, say something about this um, bringing up the Pew study and Um, we at the Yiddish Book Center actually feel like this isn't terrible. It really can be an opportunity to look at what are different aspects of the Jewish tradition to connect to. So, um, you know, literature, um, we have a new program at the Yiddish Book Center that connects um, Jewish 20-somethings to Jewish aspects of American pop culture. Um, and I think that um, they're just anecdotally from the people that come to our programs, that there is a, um, a growing complexity of what, you know, uh, of Jewish identification. Um, but at least anecdotally, again, from who's, who are coming to us, it may be someone who um, is adopted into a mixed marriage and so has a strong Chinese identity and Amer American identity and Jewish identity, but um, the opportunity for Yiddish um, and American Jewish culture to be a way to be a centerpiece to a modern Jewish identity is something, it's just an option that I think is not necessarily offered through um, Jewish institutional education, but um, it, it is an opportunity to connect, come to the history and culture from a different I could be the devil's advocate. I think we're talking all around of how the culture, the culture, the culture. I think we need to be more observant. I think we need to go to services. I think we need to let our children know where our loyalties. I, you don't have to keep a kosher house, but you can have Shabbat meals. You can sing Zemiro together. I don't think we're giving our children any, or we're not putting ourselves. Sending a child to a Hebrew school, they might have a good Hebrew teacher who turns them on, but just as likely they won't. And if it's not coming from the parents, they're not going to have it unless some experience that they have accidentally pulls them in. So I think we need to do more as adults if we want our children to stay within Judaism. I'll just add a little comment that probably fits with that that I've been thinking about as I've been listening to this piece of the conversation, which is I lived in Charleston, South Carolina for four years. And what I saw down there, now every region is different, but what I saw down there was the Orthodox community, a new young Chabad rabbi, the conservative and reform, 
all doing programming together at different points. And I felt like it really helped pull the whole Jewish community together. So maybe a little piece of it is what probably all our rabbis are already doing, but to really encourage our rabbis to continue trying to um, work together and not just isolate the Orthodox over here and the reform over there, that we can all work together. Just in appreciating that comment and going back to Chaim, it makes you think about the Grinspoon Foundation and their culture connect and the way that they actually have actually connected all of Western Mass, including the Berkshires, uh, in terms of at least knowing what's going on and the possibility of community. And I just wonder what role it's playing in the way that the fund uh, played in those earlier years. folks from other cultures here, do people, let's say from Irish cultures, do they think about the same issues too in terms of passing on Irish culture to their kids and what's happening to our culture? You know, is that an ongoing issue like it is for the Jewish people? Like, what's going to happen to the next generation? How do we pass on our culture? Is that a big issue? I clearly believe that so for, for all of the previous immigrant families in this country. My newest book is a grandmother's essays on education. And I have so many Jewish references. And I struggle to, I, can I just say Jews? But I come from Philadelphia. My first outside food experience was a Jewish deli. Oh my God, I thought God went to heaven. <laughs> I, I wrote about the Jewish, the Brooklyn ladies in Jewish. Because you cannot talk about education today and not talk about social welfare programs. And we've kind of lost our way. So, and the other thing is, I'm a product of Philadelphia Catholic schools. I'm proud of it. I can read and write and think, and I'm productive and a viable member of my community. We read the Old Testament, Torah, or Torah. We called it the Old, the Old Testament. That was part of our reading exercise, reading aloud, and so it served a double purpose, but it captured my imagination. I love anthropology. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon, blah, all of that captured my imagination. And what I'm saying to, to you now is in telling those stories, you just don't know where it'll play out. Our children need to know it. My granddaughter is Dean's List at Rutgers and in creative writing did political science fiction set 50 years in the future. And she talks about political turmoil and the cast of characters, what's happening in the world getting ready for war and she belonged to a family and she remembered her great-grandmother's stories about the history of this country. So we never know the seeds that we're planting when we tell our children's stories but everything you were saying here today I'm sitting saying that's that's our country today. We're struggling generationally with thinking we've lost the next two generations. We have to tell them the stories. It's become a secular society it's a different world, and yeah, there's generational differences, but we have to decide, each one of us in our families, what we value as a family. And it's by saying to a child before they ever get to a school, this is what our family believes in, this is what we value. Those words will carry any child through difficult situations that they encounter with value systems that are different than theirs. So I think you're talking about the American society today. And um, yeah, we be a devil's advocate. Um, we just have to figure out who, we, maybe we lost our way. And now we have to retell, we have to, I think we figured, maybe we're just getting older. Uh, <laughs> I mean, figured out who we are, but we know the stories and we, we need to tell them to our children. Thank you. I think just to say one other thing about that, you know, one across cross culturally, as um, some as I have looked um, having this point of view of oral history, one theory that I think might, is applicable to this um, discussion is about um, American assimilationism and how the generation of immigrants were really concerned with blending in and and forwarding their you know bumping their children up the socioeconomic um, ladder, which I think speaks a little bit to what Ken, you were saying about um, you know, peddlers having um, kids who become doctors and lawyers. Um, but what we've 
seen um, at the Yiddish Book Center is then um, third generation and fourth generation, once they consider themselves very comfortably American, saying, okay, so I'm American, but what is this other thing? What is this other heritage? Um, and that's where, at least I, I'm observing in the, um, the young people who come to the center, what that curiosity comes from is, is heritage. And I would say that yes, um, you know, from that, that that is happening across cross cultures in my generation. Yeah, one, two, um, one thing I've noticed in the my age, sixties, uh, is this: so many people, independent of each other, are doing their own family history, so they look at genealogy and doing a lot of their own research, and, and it's everyone's. It's in like everyone. <laughs> so I'm wondering at different stages of our development if if people are seeking different information or you know about their, their families past for different reasons. Um, and you know, I know my mother has had a big, big impact on my children. I remember my grandmother's stories and I remember her telling me that um, when I saw that the one who, you know, that was her story mm -hmm. in Poland. And um, I mean, that's, she said, that's just the way it was, you know. Um, but, I mean, things like that, when, I think when people, when, when stories are told to you from a personal point of view, and you, you can own it. Um, and I think this whole genealogy quest is um, our effort to our, our own our own history and our roots. roots. One thing that um, I found very interesting was one of my daughters was preparing to talk about this week. We went down to the Tenement Museum in um, East Side, on East Side. I recommend everyone go there. They have, we, we saw um, there was a family from Turkey, a young woman from Turkey. Um, we went up to the um, Tenement where she, you know, she lived and she talked to us. And, um, but they also have, um, there's a, uh, I think there's an Italian Tenement. Um, there were different choices we could have seen beside the Richard Street on the lower side. Hi, I'm also from Philadelphia, but I've also lived in Boston, Cape Cod, for 25 years in this area. Um, I didn't find any Semitism until I came to the Valley. I um, lived in Havley House and Authority. I had the giant fence built behind my apartment years ago, like four years ago, with articles on paper. About this black plastic fence that moved behind my apartment. It was eight feet high, about 200 feet long, and it stood there for three or four months until the American Civil Liberties got involved. The same man that constructed this fence also the last two years has been hanging Jewish um, paraphernalia on his front porch of our apartment complex. No matter who you go to in town, how they, you know, the, the select board, Mr. Nixon, the, uh, the town administrator, you name it, we've been, I've been there. And, and it, was, it wasn't until the Attorney General's office got involved did this man remove these articles. And, and nobody, had no trouble for any of these people. They're still living there. They haven't had any fines imposed. Nothing happened. They weren't even put on probation living in the complex. I'm also one of the people in the meeting group in the last article that had me for the Amherst Bulletin that was not allowed to go to take a meeting course in uh, the Hadley Senior Center. But no, the story was, was not told correctly. What happened is one of the anti Semitic women that had been after us, along with us met all these years, came after me in the larger room, and she was in the meeting group before that. It was said of the town of Hadley coming to us and sitting down and saying,